Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I have yet another viewer request video, this time going through best practices for AWS Glue. Um, so if you're not familiar with Glue, it is a fully managed serverless ETL tool from Amazon that basically says, hey, when you, you know, you can design a process like, you know, an extraction and transform a load, and then that'll only get run on that schedule on compute that is spun up and used just for that job. So it's really good for, you know, efficiently preparing and transforming data on demand or, you know, on a schedule for, you know, analytics, machine learning, or data warehousing use cases. And it's very well integrated, you know, as all Amazon products are with the rest of the AWS stack. So it's a really easy tool to add to your belt if you're already using a bunch of AWS tools. Um, but AWS Glue, while, you know, it's simple on the surface, its efficiency and ability to perform well hinge on adhering to best practices. So that's what we're going to go through in this essay, or not this essay, this video, um, going through, hey, what are the best practices for working with AWS Glue so that you can run your AWS pipelines as efficiently as possible? And if you like these videos, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot, and consider joining my Patreon for early access and to code. Um, but let's get into it. And the first thing I want to talk about here is architecture and design best practices. So the first thing I want to think about is choosing the right glue mode for you. Um, and so there's two primary options with Glue. There's the Glue Spark Jobs, which is really well best suited for large scale, batchy tail workloads, complex transformations where you need a lot of compute power. Um, and it's, you know, what it sounds like, it's Spark that's spun up on demand, similar to Databricks. Um, and then you also have Glue Python Shell Jobs, which is more lightweight shell scripts, you know, they're basically just being bash executed um, Python scripts that, you know, do more lightweight things like validations, data quality checks, where you're not doing transformations at scale, so you don't need the efficiencies that would come with using Spark for a job like that. So the general guideline here is you only want to use Glue Spark jobs when parallelism or large scale processing is required. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is Glue Data Catalog. Um, so that's actually shown up here. This is something you know you don't immediately think of when you're thinking of Glue, but Glue Data Catalog is a really good option for a centralized metadata repository for your data lake. So as you're ingesting in your data lake, you're also collecting metadata and storing that around the data that you're ingesting. Um, and it helps you to maintain you know, really nicely well-structured and consistent naming conventions so you don't end up with a data swamp. And just in general, it's good to track as much metadata as possible around your jobs. Um, and then table versioning and partitioning metadata within AWS Glue Catalog also allow you to help manage scheme evolution gracefully. So there are some tools that actually come out of the box with it too for handling change over time, which makes it another good option because you'll need to do that, um, especially you know, when you're running these for multi, multiple years and your organization is changing over time as well. Um, and then finally, you know, in the data target side of things, favorite partition data lakes. Um, you know, partition your S3 data by, you know, commonly filtered attributes like date or region, um, and try to minimize the amount of data scanned by Glue and downstream services like Athena or Redshift Spectrum. Um, and then fourth, modularize your pipeline. So it's always best to have each Glue job performing a single action. Um, so you, you know, can have one Glue job for uh, extracting, one Glue job for transforming, one glue job for uh, loading data, and then have them orchestrated together using something like Airflow or AWS Step Functions, or AWS Glue Workflows. Um, right out of the box comes with AWS Glue. And that'll help you have better handle, re error handling, retries, reusability, and also relationships between different glue jobs as well. Um, and better triangulation when something goes wrong, you'll know, you know, hey, it was the transformation step rather than, hey, it was one part of a larger ETL script. Now, the first piece of advice I have on the development side of things is to leverage AWS Glue Dev Endpoints. Um, Glue Dev Endpoints are, you know, work with Jupyter Notebooks, SageMaker, Zeppelin, and this allows you to, you know, basically set environments that can be used to test your AWS Glue scripts to give you faster iteration without needing to run an entire full-scale job. You can just run a small slice of it with a developer endpoint from something like Jupyter and just quickly test those scripts. Um, so giving you you know better optionality and also just letting you iterate and test things faster, which always leads to faster development of new code. Now, the next thing you want to think about using are dynamic frames. Um, and Glue introduced dynamic frames as kind of an abstraction over data frames that actually allows you to have you know partitions within a data frame uh, and also to you know split them automatically and handle you know more semi-structured and evolving schemas. So it's really well useful for ingesting you know, nested JSON or inconsistent data where you might need to automatically divide it up or split up the data um, or you know, just eliminate inconsistent data uh, dynamically uh, within a data frame. 
Um, and you also can convert these to Spark data frames, you know, if you want to use them for Spark functions or third party libraries there. Um, but these are a really good option just for, hey, a quick, easy way to have partitioned, easily evolving data frames uh, within the context of Glue. The, another tool that comes out of the box with Glue that you probably want to use are job bookmarks. Um, and job bookmarks allow you to keep track of previously processed data and basically set checkpoints for incremental loading and help avoid reprocessing of already ingested data. So you basically set a job bookmark and then it knows to not process any data that was processed in that previous job at the core of it. Um, and then final piece of advice you know, on the development side of things is to externalize as much configuration as possible. Uh, avoid hard coding any parameters like paths or table names or column lists, and instead try to use glue job parameters and then store config files in S3 or use AWS Secrets Manager or Parameter Store to make your code and your configurations more reusable and portable across environments rather than needing to just copy and paste constantly. Uh, and if you wanna make an update to one of those config files, you have to make an update on all of the places that are actually using that operation. So now we've talked about you know, how to run or how to deploy uh, AWS Glue and what to use and also how to develop with it. I also wanna talk about how to do performance optimization. Uh, and the first thing to do there is choosing the right worker type, right? You want to benchmark your jobs and figure out, hey, what amount of work do my jobs actually need? Um, the standard worker for Glue is 16 gigs of memory and four CPUs. Um, and you know you can increase or decrease that, change the sizes there uh, based on what you need. But you want to make sure whatever size you choose is not under provisioned, where you have not enough resources to complete your jobs uh, in the time that they should be completed, in, you know, leading to job slowdown or over provisioning where you have a bunch of excess compute that isn't actually getting used, which you're paying for and is just causing a bunch of waste in your costs. Um, and so number one, another great one way, another way to optimize your environment, you know, other than just choosing the right compute, compute is to also optimize the parallelism. Um, set your job language to Python uh, and also fine tune the number of workers and the worker type to align with exactly what you need for your expected workflows. Um, and you can also use coalesce or repartition, they're uh, tools that are built into Glue as well, strategically to control the number of output files and reorganize them to make sure all those output files are of an equal size and are getting processed equally in parallel so you don't have one parallel processor that's taking way longer. Um, and then try to pre-partition your, pre your data wisely as well to minimize shuffling and skew and having to redo uh, the partitioning of the data, let the repartition job do it as needed and don't just do partitioning just to do partition. Uh, another thing you can do is, you know, use push down predicates and push down predicate filtering in Glue dynamic frames to minimize data loading and reduce the IO costs. Um, and what that does is filters, you know, the, the actual collection of what data you're getting from that data in that data frame to just that specific filter. So it doesn't query the entire data frame or the time data catalog, it just queries pieces that match, you know, hey, year 23 and month 06, right? Um, and then Finally, think about using column pruning. You know, select only required columns during data ingestion to reduce memory and computation. You know, don't just ingest every data set at will with everything that's included in it. Normally you don't need all the data, so cut out the crap you don't need and only keep the things you do. So now the next and potentially most important piece of running AWS Glue efficiently is to manage your cost effectively. And the first thing you're gonna do is you know, use things through your Glue job metrics through CloudWatch, like I just talked about, to monitor your CPU and memory utilization over time. You know, jobs are gonna change over time and you wanna make sure that you're not over or under provisioning compute because of those, you know, it, you're just gonna be wasting compute if you are. And, and reduce to idle time and, you know, your Spark jobs, which is gonna be probably your most expensive type of work, by tuning the memory, parallelism, and caching strategies used for those operations. Next, you're gonna to wanna to think about archiving or cleaning up any old metadata you have. Um, you know, old tables and partitions in the Glue data catalog are going to, over time, just bloat your costs and slow down any kind of crawlers you have running there. So periodically cleaning unused metadata and you know, on a you know, relatively frequent basis, you know, every few months, and moving it to something like cold storage is a really good way to keep costs low and performance high as well. Um, next, Try to schedule your crawlers intelligently. You know, don't run crawlers too frequently if you don't need to. Um, trigger them only you know, when new data arrives using S3 event notifications. Um, and use things like versioning to handle scheme evolution instead of just recrawling an entire data set uh, to you know, detect what changes occurred. Um, and then fi and finally for this section, you know, use S3 storage best practices. Compress your data into Parquet or ORC files. 
Uh, try to avoid small files as much as possible, you know, consolidate data to reduce list and read operations, and use intelligent tiering or lifecycle policies for older and frequently accessed data so you don't spend as much compute actually accessing that data. Now, finally, I want to talk about best practices for you know, integrating glue into the rest of a workflow. Right? So most of the time, you know, you're not just going to be running a glue job in isolation. You're going to need to orchestrate it and link it to other operations within your data pipelines. Uh, and that's where tools like either glue workflows or more commonly Apache Airflow will be used for more complex DAGs or you know, and to implement things like retries and conditional logic and integrate other platforms with Glue rather than using Glue workflows because Glue workflows isn't really great for interacting and managing other platforms outside of AWS. So that's why you might want to consider using something like Airflow um, to actually orchestrate your Glue jobs um, in conjunction with the rest of your pipeline. So you use Glue for what it's best at, but don't just try to cram everything into Glue. Um, you're also going to want to make sure you uh, monitor your Glue environment with CloudWatch, set up an integration, and set up alerts for job failures, timeouts, uh, spikes in your compute as well are really good to understand. So, hey, you, know, you don't get surprised in the month with a massive cost spike. Um, and try to enable as detailed job metrics and logs as, as possible for your particular use cases too. Um, and then finally, just an overall piece of advice. Always implement retry logic, implement th typically three retries with exponential back off and failure notifications via service like SNS or however you'd like to receive your notifications. Um, but that are, those are all the best practices I had for you today um, are running Glue efficiently. It's a really powerful tool, but it requires you know understanding the nuance of how to run it effectively to get the most value out of it. So I hope you found that in this video. I hope you learned something. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Data Guy out.